Mars is our next door neighbour. And so the one massive resounding question that, that obsesses me is, does Mars have life? A long time has been this idea, you know, has there been liquid water? It's got liquid water, of course. It's long been understood as that's one of the prerequisites of life. When we're exploring Mars, we don't do it in person. We don't send human astronauts, at least not yet. And we send our machines, we send robotic explorers and beam back all that information back to us so we can piece it together and learn as much as we can about this other world. So if you want to design an instrument for Mars, for operation on Mars, uh, there are some key things which you have to bear in mind. It needs to be low mass, it needs to be lightweight and compact. Even just to launch mass into low Earth orbit, I believe it costs something like £20,000 per kilo. If you want to get the equivalent mass to, to the surface of Mars, it costs an awful lot more than that. It needs to be able to survive the vibration of launch. It needs to be able to survive high radiation environments. And an average surface temperature is something like minus 60 degrees centigrade. So you've got to operate Curiosity and all its instruments under these extreme conditions. Obviously, it's, it's nice to see it as a challenge, and it's amazing what can be achieved. You put it in the pointy end of, of a massive firework, launch into space, where it travels through the very brutal and an unforgiving environment, and then arrives at an incredibly high speed. So you've got to go from six kilometers per second to zero in seven minutes. That's the challenge, landing this 1,000 kilogram rover and not end up burying your, your years of work and your millions of pounds worth of, of equipment and hardware in a smoking crater. It was a, a bit of a step into the unknown. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. <laughs> That's when the exploration starts. A sol is at Mars for a day. It's about 24 hours and 37 minutes. We have to get our instruments up to a working temperature. So we only work after 11 a.m. local time on Mars. But if you want to get the most out of your rover and your science and engineering teams in the first 90 days when you don't know if things are going to last, then it's best to switch to Mars time into the rhythm that Curiosity has to go through. What that means in practice is that <laughs> every couple of weeks you end up working at uh, two o'clock in the morning. Um, but that was okay, no one was complaining because we had a fantastic rover on Mars that we were operating. Some people uh, got watches made to run on Mars time, so if you ever see anyone around Pasadena with two watches on, then you know that they're working on a recent Mars mission. Since the 17th century and the first telescopic observations of Mars, we've, we've got to learn our neighbour, this other world, much, much better. We have high resolution colour images, we have stereo images, so we can get accurate distances and elevations. And we have chemical and X-ray diffraction data. So we take all those different data sources, work out what's been happening on Mars from billions of years ago right up to the present. And then we discuss on the telephone what we think of the data and what we need to do next. So we might decide, well, that's a really interesting outcrop. Maybe there's some sign of water there but we need to get another image. We need to get a high resolution image. Perhaps we need some X-ray diffraction. And we make a plan for the next day and a longer term plan. Then we make sure that we've used an appropriate amount of power and the data resources are okay. And then we upload it to the rover. And so the cycle repeats. I'm an astrobiologist and my thrill is into looking into the possibility of there being life on Mars. And we're not obviously talking about little green men. We'll be talking about hardy microbes, kind of bacterial like life forms. And then that's going to be hard to find. And actually one of the bigger questions is whether the environment on Mars was ever conducive, was ever clement for life. We need to look at the rocks and see how, under what processes they formed. And to do that, we use tricks like X-ray diffraction. So we take our sieved material, 
um, for instance, from the drill, and we put it onto a little vibrating stage. Vibrating this fine-grade material, we make sure we've got an even mix of all the different minerals and all their different crystal orientations. The Kemeny instrument takes a source of x-rays, focus through a pinhole, then we direct it onto this stage. I'm a very narrow beam of x-rays, so it's almost like a, a torch shining not with visible light that you can see with your eyes, but x-ray light. And you collect the x-rays which have diffracted through your sample. Focused onto a CCT, a bit like at the back of your digital camera. And what we get there are these rings called Dubai rings. And we measure the radius of those rings using something called Bragg's law. So that's going back to the beginning of the century. Allows us to measure the spacing between different layers of atoms. And that's the information that tells you what kind of mineral, what kind of rock you're looking at. And on Mars, and some of the minerals, it's about one nanometer. And that tells us it's clay. It was this kind of stuff. This is modeler's clay I've got here. It's the kind of thing you know you might play with and, and make things out of it. So it's very commonplace material on Earth. But to find this on Mars is absolutely mind-blowing. This is clay that was formed in an aqueous environment. And so what Curiosity has essentially found was river mud. The mud on the bottom of what would have been a babbling brook billions of years ago on the ancient Martian surface. And the conditions needed to make this clay would have been not too acidic, not too alkaline, not too salty. And in fact, if you could have jumped into a spaceship and a time machine and gone back to that place on the surface of Mars billions of years ago and knelt down and scooped up some of that water in a glass, you could have drunken that Martian river water. It's only really because of curiosity that we know we've had these long-standing bodies of water, lakes which lasted for thousands of years. I know I could. The same technique that solved the structure for salt in 1914 is being used today to help in the search for life on other worlds. I don't suppose they could possibly have imagined that X-ray diffraction would be used on Mars. But it shows just how important the work was that they did. With all of this space exploration and trying to get to know other worlds, you're obviously always trying to push back the very frontiers of, of what we know already and, and what we've been able to achieve in the past. And you, you can't always play it too safe. You have got to take risks. You've got very little chance or no chance at all of being able to repair an instrument which isn't working properly. The answer to this is, is really lots of testing. We have this building accumulation of, of knowledge, and this helps us decide the most exciting places we want to go to next time. Mars 2020 is an interesting mission because that is likely to be the first part of Mars sample return that we can take back to Earth to do all sorts of tests for presence or past presence of life. I know I could. For me, I think having mankind in space is about the spirit of exploration. There really is an awful lot that you can do with machines like Curiosity. I think that in the end you have to do both. And okay, you can get instruments to the surface of Mars um, at significantly less cost, but ultimately there's a limit to what you can really do with machines alone. And Sending man there, you have so much more flexibility and you can make decisions right there and then with a trained eye. And I think that opens up massive possibilities in terms of the science that you can do. I would love to go, but yes, I'm probably not young enough anymore. It'd be a really major challenge just for these people to survive. And that could happen as early as the 2020s. So there, there are possibilities there. Um, in terms of a space agency sending people there, then they're going to want to bring them back and 2030s is probably the earliest that that could realistically happen. So if you'd been a microbe on Mars four billion years ago, yeah, it would have been habitable for you. Um, we don't yet know if there were any. Whether it did support life is the next stage. To think of um, the cosmos as a whole, and there are there are sort of grand questions to which we, at the moment, we don't really have much idea about. So for example, things like, why is the universe here and, and how did it originate? And 
okay, there's a simple answer if it originated in the Big Bang, but why did the Big Bang occur? And of course, day to day, I'm working on much more mundane things, but in many ways, those are the things which ultimately um, motivate me to, to work in space science. My long-term hope is we get closer to finding life on another world, because I think that would be one of the most fundamental and revolutionary discoveries that, that we could make as a species. We'd know that we're not alone in this universe. It is necessary to put in a big effort to get some worthwhile harvest of knowledge. You have to be prepared to go a long distance. Of course, we went a very long distance, over 60 million kilometers uh, to Mars, and you use a lot of resources, financial and manpower, but I'm confident it's all been worth it.